Hello, my name is Simon. I'm a professor of quantum technology here at the University of Oxford, and I want to make a video not about quantum technology, although that is a cool topic and I would like to make some videos about it. This is a video about the movie Iron Man and whether the stuff we see happening in that movie, all the fantastic uh, fight scenes and crazy stuff going on, um, is allowed by physics. Is it a yes or no from the point of view of physics um, on whether we, what we see happening could happen? I think it's quite interesting because um, it causes you to think about some of the physics and maybe the answers are a little bit surprising. I should say it's not my intention to um, upset anyone and spoil a movie for them. I really enjoy the movie. I think it's a great movie. So I'm not trying to spoil it. I'm just trying to think about it. Um, but if you would rather just watch it without someone like me criticizing the science, then maybe don't watch this YouTube video. I'm really not trying to, you know, start any fights here. I just want to, um, I enjoy thinking through the science. Um, and what else to say? Uh, I think that it's a good movie to choose because Iron Man is a technology-based hero. He, 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 his, all his abilities and powers are supposed to come from the technology that he has built and that is in our own near future. In fact, it's set in the now, uh, but it's a little bit more advanced than we have because we understand that Tony Stark, the guy who uh, wears the suit in Iron Man, is a genius. And so he is able to go a little bit further, a little bit deeper than the rest of us can, and effectively bring tomorrow's technology into today. But we're not talking about sort of Star Trek level technology and doing things that physics would consider, or that our best understanding of physics says is impossible. Um, it's just uh, making, you know, uh, 10 years time, perhaps, technology possible now. So I think that's uh, why it's a really interesting one to choose. So uh, what can we say about uh, this checklist of abilities that the suit has from the point of view of physics? First, the toughness of the suit, its strength against impact. I see no problem with that. Physics allows for super strong materials compared to the stuff that we have in everyday life. What about the physical strength that he has? Maybe 10 or 100 times stronger than a, a normal person. He's able to uh, do some pretty amazing stuff. I don't see a problem with that in the sense that you can certainly imagine lots of small, powerful electric motors which are woven close to the surface of the suit because it's quite, you know, tight-fitting, really, um, so that it boosts his own power. I don't see a problem with that. Uh, what about the flight of the suit? Can he really have little rocket boosters? I mean, they're not rocket boosters, they're something else, but effectively, little propulsion systems built into his boots and into his palms, I don't see a problem with that either. You could imagine engineering uh, something we understand today, like a jet engine. You could uh, imagine engineering a tiny version of that um, if you had enough power uh, to supply to it. It could um, accelerate air or um, and push it back out, and that would give you the boost that you need. So I don't see any deep problem with any of those things. What about the computer system? Uh, well, the computer system is the most impressive thing about the suit in some ways because it seems to be way ahead of where we are. His um, Jarvis AI is fantastic um, compared to anything that we can talk to on our phones or in our computer systems today. So that's a, a huge credit to Tony's genius that he's got that working. But again, no problem from the point of view of the physics as far as I can see. Because, um, our, of course, the human brain is approximately as powerful as that, and that's allowed by physics. You would just need a system like that that's in some other way uh, distributed in the armor. So I don't see any problem with any of those features, but we should think for a minute about the power systems. Oh, and before that, I should say, of course, the little weapon systems, like little missiles and things, nothing to say about that from the point of view of the basic physics. Why not? Why not have tiny missiles that are very explosive? We can't do it yet, but there's no reason to think that we're anywhere near the limit on that. Okay, so then the power system. This is interesting because if we tried to build Tony's suit today, we could have a go at most of the components, uh, but what would stop it from working, especially stop it from flying, is that we would not be able to build a small, light power generator that would get the whole thing going. And that's actually part of the film, is that's the missing ingredient when the, um, uh, when the villain of the piece tries to make his own suit, he can't get that bit working, and he has to steal it from Tony. So that is a, a really interesting heart of the suit, really. It, it's a miniaturized arc reactor, we're told. Now, an arc reactor isn't a thing from the real world, so we can only guess at what, how it might work, but we can use physics to put some limits on what any kind of power system will do and check that it all works out. So fortunately, in the movie, Tony actually tells us how much power his prototype, his first version of the arc reactor, produces. You should keep the shrapnel out of my heart. But what could it generate? If my math is right, I don't know as is. 
three gigajoules per second. So we're told there that it produces three gigajoules per second. Now that's actually a ton of energy. Uh, a gigajoule per second is also called a gigawatt. Three gigawatts is what a, power, a nuclear power station might produce. A good-sized nuclear power station would have that as its power input. So Tony has somehow created a little thing that fits in the palm of your hand, that at least for a while can produce the same power output as a nuclear power station. But hey, he's a genius. The question is, is that okay with physics? Can such a small thing in principle produce so much power? Well, any system that is going to produce power will have to consume something. So we'll have to consume some fuel. It's only a little gadget, so it can't consume a lot of fuel. Let's suppose that it consumes um, one gram of fuel. So uh, a, a little amount of fuel, which we, wouldn't, uh, which we easily could fit inside the thing and we wouldn't even notice whether it had been consumed or not. How much power, or how much energy I should say, can we get out of one gram of material, a little bit of matter, in uh, the maximum allowed by physics? The answer to this is really, really interesting. It uses an equation from physics that you have heard of. I don't care if you uh, never even did high school physics, you have heard of the equation that I need to use now to figure out the limits on what the arc reactor could do. That equation is Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared. So there, the m is the mass of the fuel, which is one gram. And the E is how many uh, joules of energy are going to be released, which is what we want to know. So uh, we need to work out the C squared number, the speed of light squared. Speed of light in meters per second, which is what we should be using, is um, actually uh, three with uh, eight zeros af after it, 300 million meters per second. Fast enough to go around the Earth seven times per second, by the way. So um, pretty fast, and we've got to square it. We've got to square the speed of light, so it's going to be huge. Uh, let's do that. Three threes are nine, we'll call that ten, and those eight zeros when squared will give us sixteen zeros. So c squared is about one with seventeen zeros after it. Uh, so one with seventeen zeros after it. So huge number. Um, when we multiply that by our little amount of matter, which is one gram, that's a thousandth of a kilogram, so we'll knock off three of our zeros, but that's still going to give us fourteen zeros. So that's how many joules of energy we could get out of a gram. Uh, or how much is that in uh, gigajoules? Well, a gigajoule would be one with nine zeros, so it's still, we still got five zeros left. So that would be 100,000 gigajoules. Tony tells us that his device can produce three gigajoules per second. So that would mean it could run, actually, for, according to physics, the absolute limit that a device, because remember, we're not working out Tony's, we're working out the limit that he mustn't go above. But so our device that's perfect generator, allowed by physics, would actually be able to produce the amount of power that Tony wants for, um, what, 30, about 30, 33,000 seconds before it would even use one gram of fuel. So the bottom line, Tony's generator can produce a ton of power, same as a nuclear power station, but such a little thing could produce that much power quite easily. Um, the, the limiting machine that would be allowed by physics could actually do way more than his gadget. So the, the final thing we should just quickly check on the power side of things is, is this enormous amount of power actually enough to do the stunts that Tony does, the incredible things the suit does? Can this huge power level, we suspect the answer is going to be yes, right, because it's the output of a nuclear power station, but let's just check. So uh, one, thing to, one way to check it would be to say, how much energy does it cost for uh, Tony to go up 10 kilometers, straight upwards 10 kilometers from the ground, um, that uh, would give a rough sense of the energy costs of zooming around, and as long as it's small compared to the amount of power coming, pouring out of his arc reactor, then we're going to be okay with things. All right, so um, how can we work that out? We need to know how heavy Tony and his suit is, or how much mass it has. Let's say Tony is 75 kilograms. Let's say the suit is heavier than him, but not crazily much more heavy, because, you know, we don't get the, incense, the sense that it's a massively heavy thing. So let's say that Tony plus his suit is 200 kilograms. And then it's going to go up by 10 kilometers, which is uh, 10 to the power of 4, meaning 10 with four zeros after it, meters. So uh, we need to do a little multiplication, which is the weight or the mass of Tony and his suit times the distance upwards times uh, the gravitational force on each kilogram that he's having to oppose by going upwards. 
And so that number is uh, 9.8, let's call it 10. So we need to do uh, 200 times 10, that's 2000, times 10 to the power of four. So that's uh, 20 uh, million uh, joules. 20 million joules is how much energy, quite a lot of energy, but it takes to take the suit up 10 kilometers. And uh, maybe um, his, uh, his thrusters are not 100% efficient. It's not really possible to convert energy into thrust with 100% efficiency. Let's even say, even though he's a genius, let's say that those, aren't, those boot things are not great. So let's say they're 10% efficient. But remember, he's, his reactor is producing three gigajoules per second. So it seems fine. Even that extreme maneuver is within the capabilities of the arc reactor. And given that, I think we can also allow him to use some of his boost power, you know, in a, an offensive way and run his computers. And I think there's no problem with the super strength um, feats because uh, if you look in, a, let's say, a factory which manufactures cars, you'll find big robots that can basically pick up a car, a car and twirl it around. Those robots will not use anything like the output of a nuclear power station. So um, again, he's good. He's good uh, in terms of having plenty of power for all the feats that we see him achieving. So do I have any problem with it at all? Yes, I have a problem with it. But it's, <laughs> it's and it's such a surprising thing if you, if you can't already spot what it is. Um, it goes all the way back actually to the toughness of the suit. The fact that it seems to protect him from any kind of uh, impact. We need to talk about that because it is actually a problem. This, the thing is, what I'm going to explain, uh, it doesn't make any difference how strong the suit is. The suit could even be stronger than the suit we see in the movie, which does take a bit of damage. Even a suit that didn't take a scratch during all the violent uh, things that Tony experiences would still not protect him because of a thing called momentum conservation, which must be obeyed and the suit can't help with. So it goes like this. Uh, let's think about the scene where a tank shell comes along and hits Tony in midair. Now, for simplicity, we can say that Tony was essentially still uh, compared to the tank shell, which came in from the side and whacked him. Now, the suit is super strong, so it stops the tank shell from tearing a hole through his body and going out the other side. In fact, the tank shell will not be able to touch Tony's body because it's inside this invincible suit. But still, that event would kill him, as we see it portrayed on screen. Why? So the problem is this, um, that the tank shell comes in very fast. It would actually come in, I looked this up, at something in excess of a, a thousand meters per second, it comes in very fast, and then it hits him. Now, momentum conservation insists that after the event, the momentum must be the same as before. So that means that Tony will have to be moving backwards, and the shell, well, it could bounce off, but that's worse for Tony, because then he has to move back even faster to make up for it. So the best thing for him would be if the shell carries on moving with him at the reduced speed after the impact. But even then, he will have had to suddenly have accelerated very dramatically in a short amount of time. This is the problem. So we could work out what that acceleration would roughly be if we say that the tank shell is five kilograms, which again, I looked up and that's apparently about right for that kind of tank. Tony himself, we already said, is 200 kilograms. And so uh, what this means is that if we say that the tank shell comes in and then they move off together, they will move off at roughly in the ratio of their masses, so then a 40th which is the ratio between the five kilograms and the 200, roughly a 40th of the speed that this shell came in. So a 40th of 1,000 meters per second, which is 25 meters per second. That is quite fast. It's not shockingly fast. It's about uh, 25, six is uh, one, uh, 150. So that would be uh, 1.5 kilometers per, per minute, which is the sort of speed that you might do in a car down a motorway. So it's nothing uh, shocking, but what's shocking is that Tony has to go from a standing start to that speed in a tiny amount of time. How much time? Well, basically the amount of time that it would have taken the uh, tank shell to pass through him, if it was gonna pass through him, but it didn't, it hit him. So then they're gonna move off together. How long would it have taken to go um, past him? Uh, well, less than um, a thousandth of a second, because it's doing a thousand meters per second coming in, and uh, he's le certainly less than a meter in this direction. So let's say a thousandth of a second, being generous to Tony, he's got a thousandth of a second to go from nothing to 25 meters per second. That is an acceleration 
albeit very briefly, he has to have an acceleration of 25,000 meters per second per second, because he did it in such a, you know, only a thousandth of a second. Okay, so an enormous acceleration. Would the human body be able to tolerate that? Well, my body is tolerating a force that's trying to make me accelerate right now, which is the force due to gravity. It's trying to make me accelerate downwards at 10 meters per second per second. But it's not succeeding. Look, I mean, it's, it's trying to pull my arm off right now, but my arm is, is, is fine. Um, so we are designed we're, or evolved to uh, put up with that kind of force, and uh, it's absolutely fine. If you go uh, in a fast car, um, you know, round a corner, or if you go to a fairground and experience uh, forces there, then you might experience uh, several G, several times gravitational force in one direction or another, going around a steep corner or on a roller coaster or something like that. Um, and again, your body can put up with that for a while, and it's fun. Uh, if you think about the very dangerous levels of force, then I gather from looking online that 100 G, 100 G, which would be a force that would accelerate you a thousand meters per second per second, uh, would be the kind of force that may be fatal for a human, or you may luckily get away with it if you were in, say, a car accident where those kind of forces were involved. So that would be a thousand meters per second per second would be around the, the lethal level that you might or might not get away with. But we're asking Tony to do 25 times more than that, 25 times over what we might say is the human limit, approximately the human limit. Now, he's a fit guy and he's a hero of the film, but I don't think it's reasonable to think that his body can withstand 25 times what other people's bodies can um, withstand. So what would actually happen? The uh, shell would come in, it would push against the suit, accelerate the suit. The suit inside of the front of the suit would push against Tony and accelerate him, but um, at, a, at a rate that his body cannot withstand. The forces going through his body and trying to, you know, accelerate uh, his internal organs and so on are communicated through his flesh and bone, and they just would not be able to put up with that. So what he would end up doing is being, um, it's horrible to say it, but he would be pasted against the inside of the suit, the front inside of the suit, so that when he crashed and they came and opened up his suit, he would just be Tony Paste on, on the inside of the suit. Um, and there's no way around this. The suit, uh, the strength of the suit does not protect him from this. Now, a similar problem comes uh, when he hits the ground. It's less extreme, but it's still, I think, if you run the numbers, would be likely a fatal impact. When Tony hits the ground, we see him um, in a couple of scenes hitting the ground. He seems to go into the ground only about a meter. And so in that very short distance, um, he has to decelerate from doing a very rapid speed, like something like 25 meters per second to zero. And again, his body won't be able to put up with those internal forces. It will be pasted. So the problem with the suit is that it can't protect him from momentum conservation. Is there anything that you could do about this? If we were trying to design Tony's suit for him and fix this problem, what would we do? Well, the, the solution that might be uh, allowed by physics most easily would be to have thrusters that are not only in his boots and his palms, but which are distributed over the outside surface of his suit, so that when he is about to receive an extreme acceleration event, the thrusters can fire and cancel it. So, for example, when the uh, tank shell was coming in, at the moment of contact, thrusters would need to fire out the back of his suit to cancel out the incoming force. And it would sat still satisfy momentum conservation, by the way, because the momentum would now be in the form of, let's say, the air molecules or whatever it is that he's shooting out from his thrusters. They would be moving off very rapidly in that direction so that he doesn't have to. And similarly, when he's about to hit the ground, back thrusters could fire and allow him to more gently come to a halt. Um, but he, we don't see that in the movie. He doesn't have that feature. What else could he do? Well, then you're into some... If you want it to be like it is in the movie, without the extra thrusters, and he is just okay through these extreme acceleration events, then what we need to do is go uh, is appeal to physics that doesn't really exist. Physics like in uh, Star Trek, for example, which, where we're supposed to be now 500 years in the future or something, and uh, we see a starship accelerate from a standing start to extreme velocities, even faster than the speed of light, because they can do that, and what, what doesn't happen is uh, the bridge crew all gets pasted against the back of the bridge because of the extreme accelerations. This doesn't happen, and why doesn't it happen? Because they've got something called inertial damage which is not a real thing, it's just the writers of that story putting in something, a mystery technology, that makes it okay. 
But Star Trek can have mystery technologies because it's so far in the future that they are breaking the laws of physics as we understand it. They do things that look to us like magic. But I don't think we can reasonably allow Tony to have that kind of thing. What it would need, in fact, this inertial damper type thing, it would need uh, inside his suit, he would have to have a technology that can push on every molecule of his body with just the right force to make it accelerate or decelerate correctly without having to uh, pull or tug on the molecules around it. Because that's the problem. It's the problem is that his, the insides of his body are not designed to communicate those kinds of extreme forces. So we would need to take that problem away by directly pushing on every particle of his body with um, something like a fake gravitational field would do it. So if we could fake gravity, if we could generate a gravitational field inside his suit that's just in the right direction at the right time, yes, we could accelerate him safely. But we don't know how to do that. We don't know if that's even possible. We would think that it isn't possible. And I don't think Tony has got that kind of tech. Because if he had, you know, he'd be, he'd be in a Star Trek type universe and not in the one we see him in. So that's my, that's my objection, which is, you know, you could say it's a like nitpicking objection, but I think it's really an interesting one and basic to the physics of any kind of scene where you see someone uh, surviving something because they seem to be inside, of, inside some kind of protective enclosure. So there we are. I think, uh, you know, it's a, it's a high score for the credibility of the Iron Man suit. If you allow that he's clever enough, Tony Stark is clever enough to build such a, an advanced power generator, the miniaturized arc reactor, then the abilities of the suit all make sense. They're fine. Um, the only problem we have is just in a few scenes, I think actually in three key scenes in the movie, where an extreme acceleration event or deceleration event happens, and we are given no reason to think that Tony has such advanced tech that he can prevent the consequences of that acceleration event on his own body, for even though it's inside the suit. So there we are. That's my um, only criticism of the science, really, or the only one that's uh, sort of fundamental in the physics. And I hope that uh, doesn't uh, like annoy you because I mean, it's a great, I'm not criticizing the film. I think it's a great film. It's correct to have these dramatic scenes like a tank shell hitting him and so on. It's great fun to watch, but the physics of it is not, um, is not possible as presented. Okay, so I would like to make at least one more of these where I look at a different superhero and I'm going to look at, if I do it, I'm going to look at the superhero that um, is my favorite growing up as a kid and is still my favorite, which is the Incredible Hulk. And you might think that I'm, I, if I was critical of Iron Man, I'm going to have to be super critical of the Incredible Hulk, but not necessarily, maybe, maybe not, but not necessarily, not necessarily because I want to focus on just what physics allows and not, for example, what biology allows. So we'll see. But I try to be kind to the Incredible Hulk because he is my favorite. Okay, um, if you want to see that video, then um, uh, do go ahead and uh, subscribe. And if you found this one interesting, uh, drop it a like or drop a comment in. If you disagree with me, you think I've been unfair or too fair to Iron Man, and you think uh, you know the science in it is either perfectly fine or absolutely rubbish, then leave a comment. Okay, thanks a lot.